Okay, this is Schaefer Cox. I'm going to let him introduce himself, okay? He does a better job of that. Here you go. Let's all stand up and stretch a little bit, because I'm going to go for a long time. <laughs> I was going to say stand up while you're clapping, but, you know, thought better of it. Okay, thanks. Where's Dean Porter? Oh, no. Let me see if I can open this. TSA might have messed it up, you know. I, I told him I wouldn't unlock this the last time I went through security. And they said, uh, why not? And I thought, oh, shoot, my constitution's in there. <laughs> so, I, so I had to open it up to show him why not. Um, anyway, you know, we're going to hell in a freight train, you know. But uh, it's okay to laugh about it a little bit here and there. Um, and I want to talk about that for a second. Um, be, real frank, be real frank about that. I know why you guys are here. Okay? I know why you're here. And you know what? I've been traveling all over the country. And Alaska is my favorite place. We, a lot of people there show up. But, but, I, but we're all here for the same reason. It's because we know in our gut that something is horribly wrong. You don't have to be told. Nobody told you that something was wrong. You know because you have a, a heart and a spirit and a mind that's perceptive to those, those things. And you got a sense and you know when something bad is going on. And I don't know about you, but let me... But, but, well, I think I do know about you, but I'm going to tell you how I feel anyway. The way that I feel when I look around at this current debacle that we have and that's been building for years and years is I feel like there's just this huge power out there that's just, just uncomprehensible even to think about uh, influencing it, let alone stopping it. And all I want is just to be free and to respect other people and have them respect me and to be protected by the law and do what I want, you know, and, and have freedom. That's all, I, that's all I want. And I don't know how to argue that from all the nitty-gritty statutes and everything like that. And I don't understand all the ins and outs of this giant monster that's coming our way and, and bulldozing over, over our freedom. But I, but I feel in my, in my gut... A resentment and I think that you identify with this that that you shouldn't have to understand all that stuff you shouldn't have to understand all that stuff and that our rights are rights and we shouldn't have to buy our rights with hassle we, we shouldn't have to to you know combat this giant monster with all this specialized knowledge and all this money and 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 you know, win and get our rights. You know, you hear about this, these guys that fought the IRS or fought the ATF or anything like this, and they're like, yeah, I beat them. It took me 30 years and $17,000. And you're like, that sounds like a prison sentence. 30 years and $17,000. You know, who's the, who, who's the real winner here? You know, they got you. They just got you the other way. You know, you might have won, but you were dead right. That just makes me sick, and it makes a lot of people sick. And we know that our nation, you know, we, we, we feel that it's, it's getting wobbly, and it's, it's, it's worrying us. We see this looming power. We see these videos like we saw today that they can just lock you up for any reason without, any, without, without a phone call or n nothing. You just disappear. And so we show up here. Why? because we don't know what else to do and what we get told so many times that feels like you got kicked in the teeth with a government issued boot is all you can do is you can beg the tyrant to change you can commit your life to a long slow drudge uphill to try to reform this monster and you, your heart just sinks. You're like, oh, 
gosh, is that really the, co the, the price of, of, of freedom? Is that our only chance is to try to make a, you know, go to Washington? What if I ran for office and I got elected and I could go there to Washington where I can't have a gun and try to be a good influence on tyranny? You know, and people, and people think, oh, I just, you know, it just makes your heart sink. And we come to these meetings and we leave here with this list that brrr, goes down to the floor of things that you can do, you know, and, and well, you can you keep, keep begging them and you can keep kissing the ring and maybe they'll hear you if there's enough of us. Well, you know what? That doesn't really resonate with my spirit. And I can't really come out and say there's anything wrong with that stuff. But I tell you what, it doesn't make me jump out of my chair either. And I want to tell you, I just am really excited to tell you some pretty unconventional but pretty cool stuff that we've been pioneering in Alaska. Actually, you know what? We're not pioneering it because people for, throughout all of human history have done this. But we're, pri we're pioneering it in human memory. There's nobody alive who really remembers this, at least not in this country. And I can't wait to get to that. But first I want to hit a couple of points about this, this giant monster that we're trying to, to reform, okay? I want to explain how it works and how they got us. So I'm young, I got good eyes, I can read my notes down there. <laughs> All right. The first thing that we're up against that we've got to understand, we've got to understand our enemy. And you've got to, you know, be honest about who your enemy is. And that is anyone who would take away from us the freedoms that God gave us. Anybody who, when you ask them what their authority is, their only answer is, because I said so, is tyranny, and that's our enemy. We've got to recognize that. Now, that puts a lot of people in our enemy category, but you know what? That's okay. Let's first talk about the money situation. This is how, this is the main tool of tyranny. And this all comes down to legal theory, which I'm really excited to talk about because that's how we got so far off base in this country. All right? So that's what really allowed the, the monetary debacle to be here. But, but we've got to understand the monetary debacle because it's the main tool. It really is the, the, the teeth of the beast. Here's how it works. All right? The Federal Reserve, which is not federal or reserve. It's just, a, it's just a, like a, a cooperative of, of private banks that are named after their best customer. Okay? They are allowed to print up money out of thin air, just print up trillions of dollars out of thin air and loan that to the government, to the federal government, with interest. That's a pretty good gig for them. You know, they print up dollars, thin air, loan it to them at interest. We pay the interest. That's what our income tax is for, which was passed at the same time, 1913. On Christmas Eve, there wasn't, uh, there's question even whether there was a proper quorum. But it was really shifty, and they kind of duped Woodrow Wilson into it because he was dupable, and uh, they got it passed. Now, here's why that's so bad. You know, you might say, well, what's, what's wrong with them printing up money out of, out of nowhere? Well, here's how it works, okay? Dollars respond to the law of supply and demand, just like everything else does. When the number of dollars in existence goes up, the value of each one of those dollars goes down. Now, the value lost by the dollars that you held or the retirement that was in a fixed dollar amount that you're counting on or whatever, the value lost by your dollars is value transferred to whoever printed the new dollars whether they're a counterfeiter or a federal government. That's why the Constitution says that no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. That is brilliant. You know why? Because you can't churn out gold and silver coins on a printing press. We would be better off even if they just actually printed them. They don't even actually print them now. They just email them. They just, they just hold down that zero key until they've got enough money, and then they just send it off. And, and, the, and the, the, enough value has to be robbed from our dollars that we worked hard for to make that e email worth something, that they send to authorize people to, to spend those make-believe do dollars into the economy. Now, what those uh, dollars do is they go out into the economy, you know, and they bid up prices. So when people talk about the national debt and they're talking about um, 
uh, this is something that our children are going to pay, that's not really quite accurate, you know. Our children and our grandchildren aren't, aren't necessarily going to pay that. What that's going to do, they're going to rack up the, they're going to, you know, print up a bunch more money. It's going to destroy the value of the dollar. It's going to take more dollars to do the same amount of work, like I said, you know, that law of supply and demand. And prices are going to rise accordingly. And so when a Big Mac is $35, you're paying the national debt. Does that make sense? It's pretty sneaky. If they tried to raise taxes to match their spending, they'd have had a revolution a long time ago. But this is a way that they can, they can tax us without us seeing it. Because the way it works is if they send you a bill, if you've got $100,000 in the bank, and they send you a bill for $30,000, you know, 30%. Ooh, ouch. You've got to write them a check. But here's what they can do. They can, instead of sending you a bill, which you'd be hot and bothered about, they just print up the money and they reduce, you know, they get that money. And then that, by, by them in expanding the money supply, everybody's bank account, the purchasing power, not the dollars, number of dollars in there, but the purchasing power of those dollars is reduced by 30%. So, whether you wrote them a check for $30,000 or you had everything, everything that's out on the market go up by 30%, they still robbed you of the, ability, of the ability to redeem your labor for a valuable good or service that you want. That's how they can tax you without you seeing it. Now, not only does this system weaken the individual in order to strengthen the federal government, but then here's, here's where it gets really bad. They take that money and they turn around and they offer it back to the state or the, or the local governments with strings attached. They say, the, the feds, with, with, with this stolen money from you, they say, we will give you this money if you will do this to the people in your state. And they say, okay, we'll do it. Now here's the principle. You work for whoever signs the checks. Now what this does is this is like a wrestling move where you change from being a republic to being an empire. In a republic, the people are at the top of the food chain and the commands roll downhill from the people on down to the, to the, to the, to the government, you know, and, and God gave every human being the right to life, liberty, and property and a corresponding obligation to defend those rights as an individual and through the establishing of governments to do the same. So it's, it's only reasonable that as a government gets further and further removed from those people, their power subsequently diminishes. That's how it works. That's the logical chain of command uh, in a free society that's operating under the sound uh, reasoning and, and, and rule of law. But you get that money flow reversed where they can, they can, the Federal Reserve can take it right away from you, give it right to the feds, Boom, we're not a republic anymore, we're an empire, where the chain of command follows the flow of money. And all of a sudden, the most far away, the most distant, the most inaccessible to us of the governments is now on top, rather than us. And so what, what it basically is, to boil it down into real simple terms, is the government is robbing you and giving the state and local government a cut to cooperate. And they, and, and they have figured out, and they do this in other countries too, watch it. They, they do it to us and they do it to other countries. They don't roll in here and try to boss you around and tell you how you're going to run your life. No. They buy your friends and make your friends do it. They buy our state. They bribe our state away from us and make our state do it. They give our, our sheriff's department a bunch of federal funding. And then when we go to the sheriff and we say, hey, sheriff, we elected you. You are very close to the source of authority, which is us. We want you to protect us from anybody who's going to uh, trample on our rights, no matter what they call themselves, no matter how they're organized. We want you to do that, all right? And he says, ooh, I don't know. Those people you want me to protect you from um, make up a pretty considerable portion of our budget. And so you've got this sheriff with torn allegiance because we're no longer a free republic. We're a monetary inflationary empire. Does that make sense? Is that, you, you got that? That is huge. 
We've got to understand that. They've gone to great lengths to um, hide that from us. Now, I could go into... In fact, I will, because I want to be fair to the other side, even though I think it's totally bogus and you're going to hate it after I tell you. Um, John Maynard Keynes, who was the socialist guru of the 50s, who was, who was a big advocate for this uh, inflationary system, what he said is he said, yes, I know that when you rob this uh, money from people and then spend it back into the economy, yeah, it hurts them. But you know what? Overall, in general, it's good for, good for us because the end justifies the means. And here's why. Because we take that money from them, and then the government spins it into the economy. And what that does is that creates a frenzy of activity, and more people pile on. And what that does then is it, uh, it, it gets everybody all jizzed up and making money and working hard, and the end result is better. The end result is the average person um, is, mo is better off than if we hadn't robbed it from them and, and, and give the, uh, the top another spin. That's the Keynesian model of economics. That is almost, get this, that is almost exclusively what they teach you in business school. And guess who funds business school? Guess who, the, who funds the, the educational you know, system is those fiat dollars. Of course, they're not going to you know, bash their method of funding. Now, just real briefly, what that actually does is it doesn't create investment. When the government robs from you and spends it into the economy, it creates malinvestment because it is investment that has sprouted up around an artificial influx of government dollars rather than a natural demand in the market. And so people build their life and their business around this uh, influx of, of government freshly stolen loot. And that stolen loot is fickle and it goes from place to place. But when they inject it into the economy, it creates a bubble, a stock bubble, a housing bubble, a tech bubble. All these bubbles that we've had, have, you can trace their funding to, to injected dollars. Now, why is this good for politicians? Because they can inject it where their friends are. They can inject it to where they need votes. They can inject it to where they need donors for their campaign. This is why the politicians like this system. So you get a bubble, and then they get caught between a rock and a hard place, and you get foreign holders of dollars getting mad because they're making their dollars that they're holding worth uh, less. And so they pull the, the dollar hose out of there, and the bubble starts to go down. That's a recession. You know what they taught me in high school? In the high school textbook? I, you know, I was homeschooled, but they taught me in the high school textbook. Depressions are causeless anomalies. End quote. That's what they taught us. That doesn't, that's, that's so, that's FDR, okay? This is the, the monetary system, okay? I've spent enough time on it. That's, that's, uh, that's all on that. Um, the next thing that we got to understand uh, about how our system works is that, you know what, our, our, our senators and our, our congressmen in, in Washington, they're not nearly as powerful as you might think. One thing that I've learned from uh, dealing with government and talking to these guys and, and trying to get down to the nitty-gritty of why can we not be free, why can we not do this, is they are afraid of the agencies. They're afraid of the IRS, the ATF, the DEC, all these other alphabet soup uh, agencies. Because what you do is you get, you get this, this, this kind of a separate animal from government, you know. In our government, we're supposed to have the, the judicial that, you know, reviews and applies, you know, the executive that, that implements it and the, and the legislative that, that writes it. And what you do is you get, a, you get an agency or a bureau. What the heck's a bureau? You know, we had ATF come to one of our meetings like this. We had a thousand people, and we asked them, what's a bureau? They didn't know. I said, well, do you know what an agency is? No, they didn't know that either. Well, we got the Internal Revenue Service. What's a service? They didn't know that either. You know, we got the Transportation Security Administration. What's an administration? What are these things? Certainly you know what you are. They didn't know. We called the agencies and the services. They didn't know either. I don't know. I've worked here for 30 years. I never thought that question. It's like they were like Dilbert, you know? They worked there all this life in this cubicle, and they don't know why or what they do. You know, they didn't even know what those words meant. But I think there's something big under there with who they're accountable to. And I think that's, we've got to dig that up. And I've been trying, but it's buried deep. I haven't found it yet. When it is, I'll send you an email. When I find out what a bureau is, I'll send you an email. Um, Anyway, these bureaus and all these, these things, these animals, we don't know what they are, these unidentified species of government, um, 
they, they consolidate all three functions of government into one. They create regulations that have the force of law. They have their own uh, enforcers that come out and kick your door in to make sure you're doing it. That's, so that's a legislative function to make the rules. It's an executive function to kick in your door. And then when you get, it, when you get dragged out of there with zip ties on your hand, you go, to the, you go before their, them and you have a judicial function, and they review it themselves with an administrative hearing. That is the consolidation of all three of those powers. It's, the, it's a way, it's a loophole, it's a way to get around the checks and balances, and it's so entrenched, and it is so powerful in this government that we've got, that our, that our congressmen and our senators are scared of it. And you know what it's doing to them? It's making their role of writing legislation almost purely ceremonial they're kind of just a dog and pony show and we've got to realize that that there's this this other creature of government that wasn't intended by the founders that's coming right into our life you know we've got it we've got to reckon with this this is some hard bad stuff you know here she's like oh sure you'll be so happy when you hear this guy mona says you know and here i am talking about all this horrible stuff you know i see your face is dropping you know Kicked in the teeth, you know, he says a minute ago, and then he does it. Um, so the other thing that you can do is you can appeal to this government based on the rule of law. Okay? You can, you can call them on the carpet. You can go before a court. You can, you can make your case based on logic. You can make your case based on, 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 on the Constitution and have it all ironed out and all perfect. And you're, you're appealing to them. On the, on the merits of law, and they won't hear you. Here's the, way, here's the way it'll go. We just got out of Continental Congress. The main reason that we were there is because we're being denied redress of grievances. What'll happen is you'll have a really sound, bulletproof, constitutionally based case, and you'll, you'll start fighting this case, and you'll start getting up through the, through the tears, you know, up there, and you'll, you'll get up to the Ninth Circuit Court. You guys are in the Ninth Circuit Court. It's horrible, I know, because Alaska's in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals too. You'll get up there to that Ninth Circuit Court with your case, and you want to go all the way to the Supreme Court and have this settled. And they'll say, um, we're not going to hear your case. Well, uh, why not? And they say, well, because you don't have standing. Oh, well, why don't I have standing? Because we're not going to hear your case. <laughs> and that's what they say. That's not an oversimplification. That's what they say. Next, please. And that's it. And you know why that is? You know why they operate that way? You know why you can, you can have the whole uh, Constitution and the 16th Amendment and you can prove how, uh, you know, the income tax was, was never ratified and how it's unconstitutional and it was a temporary war measure? You can have all of these laws out here, you know, all right? And you can fight it based on all of these laws. And I know that there's some people in this room that have fought it based on those laws, you know, and, and you know what? There's way more people that haven't fought it based on those laws and let me tell you why you didn't fight it based on those laws because our government does not operate under the rule of law they operate under the rule of force it's not the rule of law it's the threat of force that's what it is you know how the Oxford English Dictionary defines terrorism government through intimidation that is profound now, how many of you submit because you're intimidated? And how many of you submit because you really think the law requires you to do that and, that's, and that if, if there was a discrepancy, you could bring it to them and they would abide by the law? No, we, I submit because I'm scared and I'm not too usually of a scaredy guy, you know? But that's what it is. We don't operate under the rule of law. We operate under the rule of force in this country. And that is pathetic and sad. And let me tell you what my most profound fear is. My, most, my deepest fear is that our government is not going to hear us until we speak to them in their language, which is force.
Now, that doesn't necessarily mean violence. And let, don't get me wrong, I'm not against violence. I'm not against violence, okay? I'm not against spilling blood for freedom. I'm not against, I will kill for liberty. You know, everybody asks, would you die for liberty? That's not really the right question to ask. <laughs> the, the, the right question to ask is, would you kill for liberty? Because if you would kill for liberty, it assumes that you would die for liberty. All right? Now, about, about this speaking to them in their language, force doesn't necessarily have to be violence. It can be just pushing them into submission to the law through nonviolent means. It can be hassling them into such a rock and a hard spot that they, they, they just got to do something. But we might not even have to do that, given what I'm going to you know, keep talking about here. Now, the second, the second, the, you know, the other thing, I keep saying second thing, second thing, second thing, like 20 second things. Um, the, uh, I couldn't count the other night, you know. <laughs> they were like, and the third thing, and the fifth, and the, they, everybody correcting me on the counting is like, you're missing the point. <laughs> I, I didn't come here to count. I came here to give a big idea. It can be in, packaged up in any numbers you want. And uh, so anyway, forgive me on that. Um, Here's, a, here's an idea that, you know, you feel a little bit like you're going out on a limb uh, to say this, or at least I do anyway. But you know what? I really believe it's true. And while I feel like I'm the first one to run out onto the, you know, feel a battle with, a, you know, storm hell with a water pistol to say this, I think that it'll, you, you'll know that it's true in your heart. I don't think that we can beat them at the polls. Now, that might sound very defeatist, but let me tell you why. Because you can't overcome votes that are bought and paid for with money that was stolen from you. And they know that. And they know that all they have to do is steal enough money from a broad enough base and give it to just a big enough base to, re -secu to secure their reelection. They've figured it out. They've refined it over the years. And you know what they do? They just keep sending us back into that, 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 that fruitless eddy of vote them out. If you're mad, vote them out, you know. And then they go behind their closed doors. They snicker and they go, ha, ha, ha. They'll never be able to overcome all the people that are dependent on the money we rob and give to them. And as long as we keep them just focusing on this one single recourse of if you don't like it, vote them out, they'll go in circles for forever and we can keep this gig going for years. That's what they say. In fact, I've been there for some of those, you know? And it's just, and then, you, and then you're like, hey, guys, this isn't right. And they're like, look, buddy, you're out of the club, you know? That, that's, that's the way it goes. So that's why you feel this way. That, that sinking feeling in your, in your gut that you felt, you've all felt that, right? I've felt that. The sinking feeling in your gut is, is the expected feeling when somebody says, go do this thing. And you've never put, you know, that's impossible, this impossible task. You know, it's like, oh, there's a freight train coming. Let's all dive in front of it. Maybe we can stop it. You know, that's kind of, it's like, oh, I know it's not going to work. But what else do we have? And so it's like, throw your life into changing this freight train of government. Maybe you'll stop it. Your heart sinks at that. Because at a deep, deep level, you know what I just said. Even if you never put it into words, even if you never heard a speaker lay it out into words, you knew it was there. You sensed it. You smelt it. And you knew what it was. So that, that's where we are. Now, that leaves us in kind of a, a bad situation. Let me get some water here. That leaves us in kind of a difficult situation. But you know what? What's a hero without a difficult situation? I'm going to talk about heroes for a second here. Hope that was mine. All right, it is now. <laughs> All right, I want to tell you a story. Because I look out here and I see a lot of really great people. You know, I've gone and talked to a lot of different places. Whenever I talk to Montana, I really feel welcome. There is a real kindred spirit. There are pioneers in Alaska and there are pioneers in Montana. And I really feel like I'm in good company. I didn't say this to Chicago, okay? <laughs> <laughs> When I was talking to them, I was like, well, guys, it's a long road, but you can, you can do it if you 
if you work hard. <laughs> you know, you can do it. You know, that's what I said to them. But I really feel like I'm in good, in good company here in Montana. You know, second only to, you know, my own uh, kinsmen and countrymen in, in Alaska. So when I see that pioneering spirit, that's what America needs. And I want to talk to you, talk to you a few times about um, when I was young <laughs> and, uh, you know, discovered some, uh, some pioneering spirit, okay? Um, I was in Alaska, and there's all kinds of adventures to do there. It's huge, you know. We live in the Tanana Valley. The Tanana Valley is the size of Texas. And it's just, there's 30,000 people just right in the center, and that's it. And so there's just all this wilderness and all this opportunity. Now, the feds, I'll tattle on them a little bit because I never pass up an opportunity to bash government. Um, they, they came to Alaska, and they just, in total disregard of Article 1, Section 8, where it says no, uh, you know, they, should, they can uh, uh, have forts, docks, arsenals, uh, shipyards, and other needful buildings, you know, and exercise like authority over the such as shall be necessary. That's that. No land. No federal land. They just totally ignored that rule of force again, instead of rule of, of, of law, which is the Constitution. I had this in my pocket. If any of you wonder why I keep, he keeps tapping his pocket, it's because that's where my Constitution is. Um, so they took just billions of acres of Alaska, and they turned it into Federal Bureau of Land Management land. And people who'd lived there their whole lives and had, had homesteads there that was their fathers before them and their fathers before them, the feds showed up and they're like, you can't have this anymore here because uh, we own it now. And they're like, oh, wait, wait, wait a tick, wait a tick. And they're like, nope, no waiting a tick. Get out. That's what the feds said. And they said, well, the law says, we don't care what the law says. We got a black helicopter and guys with guns. You know, that's just how they operate. How do you argue with that? So what they did is instead of fighting people off their land, what they'd do is they'd just wait until these old sourdoughs, miners, homesteaders, whatever, just living off the land out there, minding their own business, been there for generations. they wait till they come to town to get, you know, flour and bullets, and BLM would burn their cabin, burn their homestead. There's a lot of animosity in Alaska towards the feds, and rightfully so, because that is just wrong. So... With that being the case, people hide their cabins, you know, they, they put brush on them and stuff, they make them look like a beaver house, you know, so that the, so that the feds won't find them. And there hap this story starts with just some such, one such uh, squatter cabin, that's what they're called, squatter cabins. Well, you know, I, when I got to Alaska, I was into hunting and fishing and trapping, and, and uh, I wanted to go out to the Yukon Flats where there was good trapping. You know, I'd heard it was real good out there. You know, hadn't been anybody out there for a long time. I, I wanted to go see what that was. You know, I was 17 years old, rip-roaring for an adventure. I'd kind of already left home. You know, I left home when I was about 16 and went com worked commercial fishing and, you know, went climbing mountains, you know, climbed to McKinley and you know, all sorts of adventures and uh, just everything that the frontier had to offer an ambitious young guy. And I wanted to go out there and I wanted to be in this cabin. So I got a friend of mine to fly me out there. Secret cabin, nobody knows where it is. And he goes, well, how long do you want to stay out here? And I said, well, um, two weeks. I got, I got three or four weeks worth of food. Uh, come on back in two weeks. If the trapping's good, I might stay uh, a little longer. So he flew me out there, and he, he dropped me off, and, you know, the weather was kind of coming in, and we had to come through the mountains, and lots of people die flying in Alaska. There's all these cabins out there, and, you know, people live in them and stuff, and, you know, I've heard of these, you know, crotchety old uh, geezers that live out in this cabin all their life, you know, and never come into town and stuff. It's pretty common, but it's kind of new for me, you know. And so, so he dropped me off out there, and he flew away, and and I, I remember watching that, that Super Cub take off and shake the skis and the blast of the prop wash and the snowy ice crystals. It's, you know, 50 below. You know, it's really cold. It got dropped off there right, right, at, right about Christmas. And he, he flew off, and I, I watched him circle around and head back towards those, those mountains, you know, as the clouds were coming down. And I just watched until the sound of that airplane went away. And it was just me there left in the deafening silence all by myself. Total isolation. It was 200 miles to the nearest road, and then there was another like 180 miles to the pipeline where there would be a pump station with people. And so I said about that, you know, I was you know, getting set up in the cabin and trapping and stuff. I didn't see another person for six months. The guy didn't come back for six months months. Now, I, I, I told this story last night, and I forgot to tell people why he didn't come back. <laughs> so I'll just get to that right now, and then get back to the story. He went, to, he went back to town, 
and he went to Hawaii. And he told his buddy, hey, go uh, check on this, this kid out in this cabin. And the guy tried to come out and check on me and got turned around by weather. Then he, the guy tried to come and check on me again, got turned around, around by weather, same thing. Then the guy, the original pilot, got back from Hawaii. And the, and, the first, and, the, and the friend was like, oh, he'll go get him now. And so they both thought that the other one got me. And it took them that long to figure out, hey, did that kid ever get any good fur out there? I don't know, you're hauled him in. N no. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so they, they came out there and got me. But you know what? That, that, that pressure and that, that, that dark, you know, I mean, it's 50 below, it's dark all the time, you just got, a, you know, an hour and a half of daylight. There was one, I saw uh, Alaska Airlines fly over once a day at 30,000 feet. They never saw me, you know, <laughs> you know for, for six months. And, you know, you go through a process out there. You go through a process. And you know what I've seen? I've seen myself go through that, that process politically. And I think that peop I'm seeing people all over the country go through the process. You get out there and you're just defeated. You know, you wanted to get out there so bad from town. Then you get out there and you're just, you're just, it, it just sucks. You're just stranded out there. You're sh you're, you can't, there's no escaping. You start to go nuts. You hate your situation out there. Here you, you figure that the plane must have crashed and burned and they thought both of us were in it. Or, or he, he crashed and they found it, but nobody knows where the squatter cabin is because it's a secret. You know, how are we going to get out of here, you know? And, you know, there was a beaver creek there and I figured, you know, I was working on making a bowl boat. And I figured, well, when breakup comes and the, uh, and, the, and the ice flow goes out, I'll float down Beaver Creek to Victoria Creek. I'll float down Victoria Creek to the Yukon River. I'll float down the Yukon River to the pipeline bridge, and there'll be people there. And I can get in a pipeline service truck and get a ride back to, to um, Fairbanks, you know. So this is like 600, 700 river miles because they, you know, go like this, you know. You know, and in a card, in a bowl, you know, is, is my plan. You know, that's my hope. You want to talk about hope and change. <laughs> There's some hope and change for you. <laughs> so, you know, here's what, I, here's what I learned in that situation. Because I sat down in the darkness and I was just defeated. And I was feeling sorry for myself. And I was hating my situation. And I was loathing it. And I was thinking about what if, what if, what if. And these unsurmountable challenges that are just more than any guy could deal with. And you know what hit me? You know what I got taught in that situation? Is that you're never where you want to be until you want to be where you are. And you know what? That was a dark, hard, challenging situation. And right now, with where our country's at and the way it's toppling and falling, our, our government is, we're in a dark, hard situation. But we're never going to be where we want to be until we want to be where we are. And we've got to just go ahead and gulp and accept the, the fate and the mission that has been plopped in our lap just by us being here at this time in history. And so long as we fight that, the longer it'll be until we can rise up and seize the day and be what, what history is, is longing for us to be. And you know what? Times are dire. I'll tell you another, another time where I kind of had this same feeling where, you, where it was hopeless and then you just had to gulp and, and rise to the occasion. Is it, Clyman McKinley. You know, I've led three separate expeditions to the top of McKinley. There's, you know, a lot of people die on McKinley. There's bodies all along the trail. You know, there's no way to get them off of there. And the um, um, first one was with uh, a 62-year-old guy from Michigan who, who was just a great guy. He'd not done much climbing, but he was Ironman triathlete and just a really great companion and friend. And uh, that, was, that was great. It was a wonderful trip. Then the, the second time was with my dad just before I got married. And then the third time was with uh, my wife and my best friend uh, a few years ago. And I'd like to one day when my son's old enough, uh, or maybe a few sons are old enough, uh, to, to take them up there. Because it's, a, it's an experience that I want to want to uh, go through with them, that, that, that firing uh, experience. You know, it's hard. And there's a special bond from people who've, who've, who've come together and overcome in a situation like that. And I see that bond being forged by all these people in this room because we've got a mountain.
And there's times when you're on a wind-blown knife-edge ridge and you know that there's a really good chance that not everybody in your expedition is going to live. And, you, and they need somebody to pull them together and seize the day and say, we can make it. And we can, we, can, we can do it and we can try and let's press on and let's be victorious. And you can just gripe and, and be defeated and characterized by the horrible sin, situation that's around you or you can, you can be what that horrible situation calls for. That's in our nature as human beings. And that's what we need to do. You know, it's like, like when you're sailing out, you know, uh, another time when I felt this feeling is when, you know, I'm out sailing on my, on my sailboat and remember, I got way far out from shore. Um, you know, there's about a three-day jaunt where there's, you know, rocky cliffs and there's no place to hide. And you've got to go down there for three days and hope for good weather. And you never, you can't predict the weather three days out. So you just wait till it's good and, and hope it holds. And uh, we, were, we were cruising down there. Actually, it wasn't we. It was just me that time. Uh, my wife wasn't with me. She was back in town. I was out sea cucumber diving. And uh, I'm going down this rocky... Uh, shore and I'm about you know 25 miles offshore and this horrible horrible storm comes in and it came from off off the land which is the worst kinds because then they're really cold they come out of Canada and it comes pouring over the mountains and I'm out here on this on this on this boat by myself and I'm having to make it to shelter and I see just the blackness on the horizon and I'm listening on the VHF radio you know seas 25 feet you know, shoot, my boat's only 35 feet, you know, you know, small craft advisory, you know, and then the, the, the wind gets really tight and those waves get stuck really close together. That's when they're dangerous. It's not, you can have a, uh, a 60, 70 foot sea, no problem. If they're rollies that are nice and far apart and you just go down one and up the, no, no problem. But when you get a 25 foot sea that is, is, you know, 25 seconds apart, and they're stacked in there close, boom, boom, they start pounding your boat, they start coming over, they start filling it, you know, if your pumps can't keep up, you sink, and they usually don't find you, and you can't swim very well, and the water's like just warm enough to be moving in, in Alaska, and, and here you see this storm out there, and so this is, this is a different kind of situation where you're in a position of relative comfort, but you see this hell on the horizon, and you know that you've got, a, you've got a challenge. You've already been up for uh, a day and a half. And you know you're going to have to be a, up for another day and a half to pilot this boat in. And if it gets worse, it might drag on further. And you're going to have to go with no sleep. You're not going to be able to leave the tiller to eat or, 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 or drink much. You might be able to lash it down just for a minute, enough to go get some, some water and a cracker or something. And, and this is going to, you don't have anybody to trade off with. You don't know if you're going to get exhausted. You don't know if you're going to get washed off of the, off of the boat. And you got, you, you know, it's catch 22. If you tie yourself to the boat and it flips over, uh, sailboats, if they're battened down correctly, they will right themselves. But when you got all those sails, it, take, it can take, you know, six, seven minutes for those t sails to move through the water while that keel pulls the sailboat over. Then once that sail gets in the air, push, it comes back up. You know, and you can, you can write a sailboat that way. So if you tie yourself, well, then are you going to drown while you're underneath there? Or are you going to not tie yourself on there and, and maybe get washed off your sailboat and, and have it go and you stay? And so you're, you're thinking about all these things, you know, and, and, and lots, of, lots, of, lots of dangers. And you've got to reckon with this. If you haven't reckoned with what might be yet to come, you'll be crippled by what's at hand. And you know what? We've got some dark clouds on the horizon. And we need to honest up and talk about those and what we're going to do. Otherwise, we're going to be useless at what's at hand. If you haven't gulped it down and say, yeah, I might die in that storm, and now I'm going to get ready for it. If you just sit there and you just stare at them, not wanting to let your mind go through the process that would, that would say that you might die, you're going to be useless. And I wrote a poem. I usually don't read my poems to people, but since it's Montana, I'll do this. I wrote this poem before I sailed into that storm. And we've been in a lot of storms, but this one just sort of hit me in a special spot. Maybe it's because my wife wasn't with me. Um, there's been good, there's been sad times 
I've had. But death will have no sting. As I offer my soul to an angry sea, my lips will softly sing. For the time has begun for my toil to be done. My hands now work with ease. For I'm made anew, and I'll wait for you on the shore beneath the seas. Once you've accepted that you're done, you can begin. And that's what we need to do here tonight. That's what we have to do. That's what our children need from us. That's what our country needs. And let's not confuse our government with our country. They're different. And you know what? There's people all across this country that are rising to the occasion, that are meeting the challenge, and there's going to be a bright page on history. Now I want to talk about how we've done that in Fairbanks so it's not just an idea. All right? How many of you know who Sun Tzu is? I don't either. I just know his name. But he wrote some really good stuff about war. Sun Tzu wrote The Art of War. You know what the 13th rule of war is? Get your enemy to do useless things. They're using that one on us. All right? And we need to recognize it. How many of you can guess what the first rule of war is? Declare war. Seems elementary, but it's really true. If you, don't, if you haven't identified who your, who your enemy is, you will never defeat them. And we need to identify who our enemy is. That is anybody who would threaten or purpose or connive any scheme to take away our liberty and anyone who cooperates with them. Basically, federal government and people who take their money. And, you know, the international super states and whatever like that. All right. So, declare war. Now, let me tell you, once there was a, a cultural shift in tide in Fairbanks to accept this challenge, here's how we did it. First, we knew that we needed to do things that weren't contingent upon government cooperation for their success. Amen? That would be silly to, to think that, you, you know, if you've, if you've declared an enemy, that, the, that you are only going to defeat him once you get their permission to defeat them. You'll be waiting a long time. You'll be sending a lot of letters to your congressman before you get one back that says, all right, guys, now's the time. Beat us. All right? Here's what happened. Here's how it all started. I do a lot of TV and radio in Fairbanks uh, talking about economics mainly and, and legal theory and stuff like that. And uh, somebody asked me, called me after a radio show, and they said, what are we going to do about all these gun laws? Man, they're just coming down like a hailstorm. I said, well, I don't know. Let's get together at Denny's and talk about it. 150 people showed up. There were so many people that the fire marshal showed up and was trying to kick us out. And I said, okay, well, hold on, hold on, you know, hold your questions, hold your questions, you know. And he wound up staying for the whole meeting and, and, and getting right on board and forgot to kick us out. So, so um, here's what we wrote up in Denny's. That, that first meeting, 150 people. The next meeting, 750 people. The next one is about 1,600. Next one, 5,000. Just blah, 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 blah. Went up. Now we've got to rent the, the Carlson Sports Arena, big football stadium, to hold these medians, meetings in. We had uh, Rick Jor come up and, and speak for us at one of them. We wrote this declaration, all right? This isn't a petition. A petition is asking somebody to do something for you. And you know what? I'm kind of sick of asking other people to do stuff for me. I'm going to tell some people what I'm going to do. You know, the first thing they teach you when you go to counseling is the only person you can change is yourself. And we've kind of got a, a it was, it, we, we, we circulated this thing, and in about three months, we got about 15,000 signatures in Alaska. I mean, it just went everywhere. I had to get a bigger mailbox because people were sending these to my mailbox all the time. Let me read you this. Now, if, this, if you think that this is true, when I'm reading down through here and you're like, you know, that's true. Why don't you just stand up and say, yep, that's true. Let it be known that we the people of Alaska, Montana, stand in recognition of the true principle 
that whenever a government abandons the purpose for which we have created it, and even becomes hostile towards that which it was once a defender of, it is no longer a fit steward of the political power that is inherent in the people and lent to this government with, uh, uh, and lent to this government with strict conditions. These conditions are clearly defined in the United States Constitution and understood by the common man. Furthermore, to the extent that our government violates these conditions, they nullify their own authority, at which point it is our right and duty to entrust this power to new stewards who will not depart from the laws that we have given them. This being the case, let it be known that should our government seek to further tax, restrict, register firearms, or otherwise impose on the right that shall not be infringed, thus impairing our ability to exercise the God-given right to self-defense, which precedes all human legislation and is superior to it, that the duty of us good and faithful people will not be to obey them, but to alter or abolish them and institute new governments, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to us shall seem most likely to affect our safety and happiness. You know why you sign this? You know why you stand tonight? It's not for, to tell the government that. It's to tell all the other people who felt like they were alone that they're not alone. And that the, the human heart that wants to be free and that wants to be respected by everyone and, and to respect others is, is uniform and consistent. And that we're not going to back down on this. That we're not going to deny what's in our heart for anybody. And so you sign this. And you make it public. And you put it in the paper like Mona said. And you know what that does? You know, this is a pretty hardcore group right here, but you know the people who, who maybe hadn't thought about it, and maybe the people that were on the fence didn't know if they thought that their, their liberty was worth defending? Well, then they, they had to think about it. This forced them to look at the clouds. It forced them to put, to put pen to paper and put it where other people can see it. And somebody who's taken a position and made a stand publicly and been bold once before will be far more likely to be bold once again when it is really required of them. So, I'm not going to tell you guys what to do down here in, in your neck of the woods, but I think you ought to sign this. I think you ought to make it pu public, and I think you ought to send this out as a word of encouragement to every other patriot in Montana. And this is plenty to do it right now. You can sit down. So we did this, this is, and this was then a big group of people that were rallied around a principle. And that's the best kind of group, is a group of people that are rallied around a principle. Let me talk about political parties just for a half a second. A political party used to be a group of people who were working together because they were united under commonly shared values and principles. But anymore, what it's become is a strategic alliance for power with no ideological prerequisite whatsoever and that's really too bad and we, we got to kind of recognize that now that doesn't mean that you know the idea of some folks working together is bad but but we got to recognize that political parties can wind up being that so the declaration this started to change the cultural tide in Alaska because it's really uh, not a battle against the feds against tyranny as much as it is a battle for the hearts and minds of your community you know and we can be characterized by what we hate in tyranny but that's just going to get us wrapped around the axle we're going to come to these meetings we're going to leave angry we're going to leave defeated we're going to feel uh, worn out it takes a tremendous amount of energy to focus on something negative and it hurts everybody around you we need to not do that we need to be characterized by what we love, not characterized by what we hate. Yeah, I hate tyranny, but you know what? I really love liberty. I love the idea of respecting other people and letting them do whatever they want and letting me do whatever I want and, and helping each other out like good neighbors. 
you know? And if somebody's encroaching on you and hurting you, well, I'm going to come to your aid. Because when somebody is, is making an assault on my neighbor, that's an assault on the principle that's protecting my liberty. And so I'm going to come to my, the aid of my neighbor and I'm going to help him defend himself. Because we have a common interest in, de in, in defending our liberty because the fact it's out of hand, we're both screwed. So, with that principle, a few months after this, this declaration really started going and people started rallying around these ideas and we had a, a philosophical kind of a, a sway, we started realizing that, you know, government makes a lot of promises. They promise to protect us. You know, I don't think they can do it. They make a lot of promises they haven't kept. It's easy to make a list of the promises they've broken. I bet you I couldn't get a promise that they've kept out of this group here. Or at least not botched up beyond recognition. <clears throat> so here's what we did. A way for people to hang together. You're going to love this, all right? This is really cool. This is something that you can do, that we've done, that's working, that totally doesn't require the man to give you his blessing. You don't have to kiss the ring or worship Caesar to get this to happen. You don't have to talk to your legislator. You don't have to get your sheriff on board. This is a way that people who know what's right can just start doing what's right and put out an open invitation for anybody else to join you. That doesn't make my heart sink. Like the, 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 the babble call of, go get these crooks to be uncrookified. <laughs> that one is a tall order. All right? We set up the Liberty Bell system. The Liberty Bell system is an automatic phone system where every freedom lover in, in Fairbanks can be instantly accessible to the others. Here's how it works. To ring the Liberty Bell. The Liberty Bell operates under the 6,000-year-old common law system and the Fairbanks Common Law Court, which I'll tell you about in a minute. I'm excited about that too. There are only two laws in common law. Do all you have agreed to do. And number two, don't encroach on other people or their property. Simple enough. You're all lawyers now. If you are being harmed by anyone who is breaking one of these laws, you can ring the Liberty Bell, just call the Liberty Bell operator who will then send a message instantly to thousands of people in Fairbanks who are willing to assist you. By ringing the Liberty Bell, you agree to stand before the common law court and explain your situation if asked to. And it's got the Liberty Bell number. Now, the scenario where this might happen is suppose you get pulled over and the cop says, um, step out of the vehicle. I'm going to search your vehicle. And you say, um, no, you have a Fourth Amendment restriction that you can't search my vehicle unless you do it the proper way. Get on the ground or I'm going to tase you. I'm going to search your vehicle. Okay. <laughs> you call the Liberty Bell. And all of a sudden, five, six, seven hundred people show up with their cell phone cameras to watch whatever's going on. You know how this works? Those troopers, those troopers, they get wicked polite in a real fast hurry when, when people are watching. They hop, they hop right in line. They, yes, sir, no, sir, won't break your constitutional rights, sir, okay. Um, you just uh, have a seat in your car. I'm going to see if I can get a warrant to search your vehicle. You know, meanwhile, everybody's just watching, you know. And, uh, well, they couldn't get a warrant. Have a nice day, you know. And, and, and this is a way for us to keep our government accountable. They, they work for us. We need to pay attention. It's only right. It's only right. Now, we got a little bit of flack from the, uh, from the cops. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Um, on the flip side of this card, it says, when you receive a Liberty Bell call, number one, go directly to the given location. Number two, don't aggravate the situation. Number three, record everything. Number four, don't draw conclusions from partial information. And number five, weigh everything against the Constitution and the two laws of common law. Under common law, you know, there's two laws. Do all you've agreed to do and don't encroach on other people or their property. The con first one, do all you've agreed to do, that's the basis of all contract law. And don't encroach on other people or their property, that's the basis of all criminal law. And we have to understand that the Constitution is contract law. It is between a people and an entity that they created to help them defend their rights. It's contract law. And you've got to understand what a breach of contract means. Heavy stuff, but it's real basic, huh? 
try to explain this to the DA. He came to our last meeting. Is a meeting like this. We had the DA, front and center, heckling. It was beautiful. All right. All right. To be added as a Liberty Bell responder, you must understand and agree with the spirit of the Liberty Bell system. Fair enough. Uh, be willing to respond to a call. Yeah, that's, that's a given. And email your cell phone number and name of service provider to libertybell911 at gmail.com. And then it has a, for, for more information, call this number. This Liberty Bell system took all those people that signed that declaration and turned them into a group of folks that are not going to let any one of us be singled off and bullied out of our God-given, constitutionally recognized rights. That's something that we just did. We didn't ask anybody's permission. We, did, we, just, we just did it under our natural right. You know, John Locke, who's a swell chap, says that the rights of law and self-defense belong to men as men and not as members of society. That's true. And we can create a contract and subcontract out that right to a government to help us defend our rights. The Declaration of Independence says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Didn't say to do what the electorate says, governments are instituted among men. Didn't say to manage everything real good, governments are instituted among men to protect these rights. Governments are instituted among men. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. They can exercise a power that is not just without our, our consent. That brings us back to the rule of force instead of the rule of law. So, we got the Liberty Bell system. We got, the, we got the, the declaration that's changing the cultural tide. We got the Liberty Bell system that is getting people standing together, uh, unified on principles. And we've got the, um, the, the next thing that was in there is the common law court. Okay, I'm trying to run through this real fast because I know we, we're, we're about to run out of time here. The common law court, this is the biggie. Okay, we didn't create a grand jury to wring the nose of government. We didn't create a, a, a grand jury to just to indict some politicians and pick a fight with the government. You know, oh, we're going to make a grand jury and stick it to the man, you know. The man, the man gets mad when you do that. Here's what we did. We said, our government is a joke. They're so broke, nobody will loan them money. They're so far in the hole, they'll never get out. They've got so many balls in the air trying to juggle that it's all going to come crashing down. They've got one foot in the grave and one foot on, on a banana peel. And they can't keep this up. And it would be the height of ignorance and arrogance to think that the fate of our republic would be any different than all of the other Republicans, republics in all of human history that got to this totalitarian point where you have human beings trying to play God, they can't quite pull it off, and they collapse in on themselves. That's where we are, folks. We don't need to gun down the beast. The only entity that is strong enough to destroy this beast of tyranny that's been lording it over us for so long is that beast of tyranny. And they are doing a plenty good job without our help. So you know what? I got a different perspective when I see these bailouts. Great! Keep at it. Let's have one every Friday. You know? I'm not into ripping band-aids off slow. Let's just get this done with. Carry on, my wayward son. There will be peace when you are done. You know? Get on with it. And what we're doing is instead of trying to, to salvage and save and reform this thing that we just know in our guts is beyond repair, we're just getting ready to rebuild. Oh, the relief. You don't have to unpickle the pickle. You can get a new cucumber. And that's what we're doing. It's baked in the cake. So let me talk just briefly about how this common law court works because it is awesome, it is up and running, and it is working. All right? What is law? That's the first thing we've got to understand. Okay? What we think of usually when we think of law right now, and we've got to unlearn this, and Lord knows the only thing harder than learning is unlearning. Am I right? All right, when we think of law, we think law is whatever the government says. That's not law. That's statutes and codes. All right? 
and they're fickle and they're made by human beings, they can be unmade as quick as they, they can be made. Law, the laws of human interaction, the laws of proper human conduct are no different than the laws of mathematics or the laws of physics. They were created once. They cannot be changed. They can only be discovered and applied. They have the same source, the same origin as the laws of physics and the laws of mathematics. God made them once. He put them into spin in this globe. And whether we ignore them or not, they're there. Their forces are at work in our lives. They're working their magic on us. It's inescapable. To, and it, they're scientifically provable to the extent that people follow the natural law, the common law, the higher law, things get better. And when people ignore it, things get worse. And usually the largest violators of these are governments. Because political power now is, is a, attaining the privilege of using force on people who have not hurt anyone. Law is force, pure and simple. And the only time that the use of force is appropriate, whether you're an individual or a government, is to defend, never to aggress. And we, in America, today, shoot, the whole world today, have, lost, has, have gone so far, we've lost sight of law being a defensive mechanism. And all we see is law as a way to hurt others, a way to exert coercion and force over others. And so rather than trying to restore law, which defends all, we find ourselves scrambling to be the one in control of the arbitrary political power. This is a huge change in, 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 from mainstream politics. But you know what? If if us in this room was U.S. Congress and we were exercising the arbitrary control, I dare say we'd do a better job, but it would not be a step forward. It would just be a shift side to side because there's no basic difference in a human dictatorship whose power is self-derived and absolute. That's not the rule of law. That's the rule of men. And the rule of better men instead of worse men might be better, but it's still miles inferior to the rule of law. Does that make sense? So, here's how the common law court worked. Let me talk, let me talk about how uh, a, a judicial furniture, all right? The furniture in a courtroom tells you how they think. I'm serious, just a second here. All right, you go into a political law court, a statutory court, where there's codes and statutes and stuff. You go in there, over here in this corner, there's this giant chair. It's like a lifeguard chair. And the judge is up in this chair and there's all this immaculate oak, you know, just took like, look like, you know, just, oh, how many Davis Bacon man hours went into that chair? I don't know, but a lot. Okay. And then the, the, uh, the ceiling tiles radiate out from the judge like he's the center of the universe and the, and the, the floor tiles radiating out from the judge. You know, you, it's just magnificent. You almost hear the hallelujah chorus when you look at this chair. And then down here, you've got a desk with a drawer, two drawers. That's how much stuff you've got to shovel through when you're before this judge. Two drawers of stuff and a plug-in for your laptop. You've got a, a desk for the plaintiff and a desk for the defendant in front of the high, judge high up in their chair. And then over here, kind of pigeonholed, satellite to the whole accessory, the whole ball of wax, you got these jury, uh, this jury box. And they're just down on ground level, and they're probably sitting in uncomfortable folding chairs like you're in right now. And, uh, and, and, they're, and they're, they're sitting there. And when the judge comes in, everyone says, all rise, you know, this deification of humanity to do all, of, of this judge. You know, when did we start doing that? What makes us think that that's a good thing? There was a hearing one time, um, I was t testifying before the, the Alaska legislature about the um, uh, jury nullification, I'll keep this real short. Um, we we're talking about it and the, the attorney general said, we can't leave that discretion up to the jury because they're just human. They'll make mistakes. We need to leave that up to the judge. <laughs> he tipped his hand, didn't he? He believes that the judge is divine. 
And you know what? That's nothing to joke about because there's a new religion in this country and we've got to recognize it if we're going to win this war. The, the God of this religion is government. And the legislators have become priests. And the capitol buildings are temples. And the, and the ritual that they perform is legislation. And there's a whole slew of people out there that subscribe to this religion called statism. And they really truly believe sincerely in their heart that if the priests can apply the right combination of rituals in those temples, they, that any problem that, we're set, that, that is before us can be solved by this God. They can make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. You know, they can raise your kids, make your kids turn out good. They can make sure that you don't get sick. They can make sure that you are prosperous. They can change the weather. Think about it. Think about it. This is, I mean, it's funny, but it's sad. We are asking government to stand in God's place. And that is the highest form of idolatry. Back to the furniture in a courtroom. All right, so that's how the political law court is set up. Here's how we set up the common law court. There's a jury box high up here. There's not a judge. And you have a pedestal for the plaintiff and a pedestal for the defendant. These beautiful marble pedestals that somebody donated to us. And inscribed on those two pedestals are the two laws. Do all that you have agreed to do and don't encroach on other people's other people or their property. If you forget the, what the laws are, you don't got to look it up. It's right there. You know? All the laws there are is right there. And all of common law is, der is derived from those two laws. It's the refinement of the application of those two, two laws. So then over here, you have a desk. You've know, got the jury right there, plaintiff and the defendant right there. You've got a desk right here where the jurist sits. You know what a jurist is? A jurist is a, a legal philosopher who is known for their knowledge on matters of law. That's Black's Law Dictionary of what a jurist is. Frederick Bastier was a jurist. John Locke was a French jurist. There was some good stuff came out of France a long time ago. And um, so the jurist sits here, and the job of the jurist is to uh, be an informational resource to the plaintiff, to the defendant, and to the jury when, when asked or whenever it's, it's necessary. And then over here on this other side, you've got a recorder, uh, a, a secretary that types everything down. That's how the common law court works. And it operates at roughly 180 bucks an hour, depending on what the price of silver is. Because we pay the jurors one ounce of silver an hour, we pay the jurors two ounces of silver an hour, and we pay the, we pay the recorder one ounce of silver an hour. And here's how it works. You go before the, grand, you, you go before the jury, if, if somebody's got a, a dispute with somebody else, and we didn't ask for any sort of government blessing on this, this has been the natural state of man. And if you look throughout all of history, everybody from the Papa Unas in New Guinea to the German War Guild to the, the Roman merchants after the fall of the Roman Empire to the Irish common law, to the old English common law in the 12th century, to the Old West, to the Founding Fathers, it's all common law. That's why they call it common, is because it, is the, it has been the natural way that people organize themselves throughout all of human history. It's just as natural as a man and a woman falling in love and building a life together. You don't have to be taught to do that. It just, it just happens, you know? It just makes sense and everybody does it, all over the whole country and all over the whole world. Common law is the same way. People have a natural pro propensity for organizing themselves in this fashion that I just described. We didn't make it up. We, well, we sort of did make it up and then we found out that everybody else had made it up too, just the exact same way. Funny how that works. So, you come before the common law court, you don't shovel through minutia and tit for tat in a desk, you stand at a pedestal, you plead your case out of common sense uh, merit before a jury of your peers, they make a decision, it requires a unanimous decision of the jury. You know why? Because right, this, these generation four Glocks kind of got a sticky grip. Um, you know why it requires a, uh, a unanimous decision from the jury? Because right and wrong are not a matter of opinion to be decided by, an, by a majority. It assumes that right and wrong is knowable, that it is attainable, and that if a jury will apply themselves with diligence to seek out what is right and wrong in this case, that there can be a unanimous consensus because it is an objective, discoverable, knowable, definable, attainable truth. 
random, out of the phone book. And we send people out there with, well, I'll get to it, don't, uh, it's coming around. Okay, um, so, so that's, how, that's how the jury um, functions. It requires a unanimous um, vote to, for, for guilty or not guilty. Now here's the way common law works. It is all based on restitution and setting things right. There's not this concept that if you did wrong by somebody, now you've got a debt to society? Uh, I didn't, don't even think society was there when it happened, you know? So you got this debt to society, so the lady that, you know, you got broke her house, broke into her house, robbed her stuff, broke it all up, you know, um, these punk kids that did it or whatever, they say, in a political law court, they'd say, now you got a debt to society, so you're going to go to j juvenile jail, you're going to get to marinate with some real gems in there for the duration of your sentence, you'll come out a better man, sure, it's like a criminal convention, you know, in there, in jail, you know, all they got to do is sit around and talk about how to do more bad stuff, so they, they put him in jail, they tell the lady, well, you're SOL uh, on the damages done to your house there, um, and we're going to double ta tap you for the, the taxes to keep these kids in jail, and probation officers and all this stuff. And then these kids, they just get stuck in this eddy. You know, they get out of jail, they get right back into jail. They can't get a job, so then they get back into jail, you know. And they're just infinitely rotating around in the system. Meanwhile, the person that was victimized didn't get restored, and she sees that our justice system is a joke, all right? Here's how the common law system handles this. The boys come before the common law court. They don't have a leg to stand on. The jury convicts them real quick, so it's a cheap trial. And um, the, the jury gets together with the jurist, and they come up with this. Okay, boys, you yourselves, since you don't have any money, you're going to come up with $700 to pay this lady for her time and her trouble. You're going to pay this court, you know, however many ounces of silver it was, 12, 13... 14, 15 ounces of silver, and you are going to replace the windows you broke, you're going to give her all of her stuff back, and you're going to restore her as nearly as can possibly be done, as nearly as possibly can be done before you violated her rights. And you can either do that, or you can choose this other option. Now everybody asks this, how does a common law court enforce their decisions? A political law court re 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 relies on the threat of force. If you don't do this, we're going to mess up your life something fierce. That's what, how a political law court gets you to comply. A common law court is all voluntary. Nobody is coerced. Everybody does it voluntarily. Here's, what you, here's what the, the way it works. The only way you can enforce your rulings in a common law court is outlawry. You heard of Old West outlaws. Here's what outlawry is. Somebody says, no, I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to pay the lady. I'm not going to fix the, the damages that I did. I'm out of here. You, the court says, okay, well, this is not a coercive political court. We are not going to force you to abide by the law. And when we talk about the law, we're talking about the universal, undisputable right and wrong of human conduct that has been ag agreed upon, those two laws. They're the ones that have sifted to the surface through all, all history and proven themselves. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna not abide by that, if you're not gonna abide by what the court has to say uh, about you doing right by other people, then you're gonna forfeit your legal status. You're gonna declare yourself, by your choice, to be outside the law, outlaw. And if you're outside the requirements of the law, you're also gonna be outside the protection of the law. So if somebody does something bad to you, you have no more legal protection or legal standing than a wild animal. And if somebody wants to capture you and make you their servant, they've got just as much right to do that to you as they would to a, a wild boar or a wild goat or whatever kind of wild thing you'd capture. And so you print up posters of these people that have chosen to be outlaws. You distribute it all over so nobody will do business with them because you know that they're not folks that respect people's rights. And you don't have any protection of the court. If somebody cuts your thumbs off and makes a necklace, this court's not going to help you, you know? And, and that's outlawry. And you know what? Nobody chooses outlawry. We've even got the situation in Fairbanks where you've got the, the political law court, statutory court, overlapping with the common law court, where people could say, well, I'm going to thumb my nose at your common law court, and I'm going to rely on the political court to, to protect me. 
They don't even do that because they want to have good social standing. And you also tell them, well, you know, when it hits the fan, and we've all talked about it hitting the fan, this protection will go away for you and it'll be open season on you and there's no coming back uh, and, and, and regaining your legal standing. So you might, you, you'd better, if you're going to function in a civil society, you'd better get on the ball and do it right now. And they say, okay. Now this process, this common law process, as opposed to the political law process, is redemptive all around. The woman whose house got broken, she's redeemed. It's all put back. It's, it's, it's back how it used to be. Nobody bore the burden except the one who made the offense. So it didn't victimize all the taxpayers in the process. And most importantly, the ones who committed the crime, the one who violated the rights of others, redeems themselves by making restitution and walks out of that court and walks away from having made that restitution with, with a new opportunity. They've, it's redemptive. It's, it's restoration. People know in their heart that this is good. And this is what's guaranteed to us. Now, for those of you who are thinking, well, he lost me at the court. All right? It is guaranteed to us in the Seventh Amendment. That, this was great. <laughs> The DA came to our last meeting, and he's like, well, the Constitution doesn't allow for common law. And I was like, well, law school doesn't allow for the Constitution, apparently, because the Seventh Amendment says, in suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by jury shall be otherwise reexamined in any court of the United States other than according to the rules of common law. This is a constitutional right for a common law proceedings that is just as important for us to protect as our Second Amendment right. Actually, we don't have any constitutional rights. We only have two. The only two constitutional rights we have. You like that? Good. You can clap. Um, and we don't need their permission or blessing to do it. We don't need their permission or blessing to do it. That's the key point. So anyway, that's how the common law court is working. How do we select juries? Totally random. You send a couple of guys out there with, with a, a, a summons. You say, you've been randomly selected for jury duty. We're not, going to, um, we're not going to force you, but you get paid an ounce of silver an hour if you want to come down and sit on this jury on a Thursday night. And most people say, okay, I'll do that, you know. And um, the compulsory... Put, a process for, well, we're getting into the minutia. Uh, I've been talking with some other people about how you could maybe make one of these around, around here because it's beautiful. And when this whole thing, this whole joke of government that we have right now comes crumbling down, we want to have something because my, I'm afraid of tyranny of the mob, you know, because that's just as bad. Anarchy and tyranny of the mob is just, anarchy and tyranny of the mob are kind of different. But tyranny of the mob is just as bad as tyranny of the elite because they're faceless. And we have a duty to protect some sort of order, even if it is just amongst ourselves. So that's how the common law court is working. And then the next thing that we did is uh, we created a militia. Everybody kind of a little bit timid about that, you know. But you know what? We, we, one thing that we went over it, it uh, and I know I, I'm going over. I'm here. I'm going to wrap up real quick. Um, one thing that we went over at Continental Congress is that the states are in violation of the Second Amendment because of our absence of citizens' militias. And that's nobody's responsibility but our own. That's our own fault. And so we created a militia. And there are 3,500 armed, well-trained men under my command in Fairbanks right now. And they are... They are rip-roaring, ready to go. They're able to speak to the government in their language, which we hope won't happen, have to happen. But you know what the militia is? The militia is anybody with a gun and a conscience. It's anybody who, who values their freedom and the freedom of their neighbor. It's, it's somebody who's, who's, who's got that sense of duty to their fellow countrymen. It's beautiful and it's right and it's good. And we ought not to hide from it. We ought not to let the media um, 
you know, scare us out of that. You know, the, all the founding fathers said that that was the only place that was safe for military force. Because every man who's in the militia is restrained by his own conscience. You know, it's a little harder to do that in a conscripted army where when you say march, they go or they throw you in the brig. In the militia, if, if I give an order, I say, if I say go do this, it, it's only followed congruent upon their conscience. It's not a command control structure. It's a command suggest. It's a command information. It's here's what's happening. Here's what we're going to do. Here's why this compels our conscience to do this. If your conscience compels you, follow this order. You know? That's what, that's what that is. If your conscience compels you to, to, to do, do what's right here and, and to defend your, your neighbor or whatever, th then do that. You know? It's like having 3,500 checks and balances on the commander, which you don't necessarily have in the, in the current military structure. Definitely not on blue helmets, but let's not even go there. <laughs> All right, so that's the militia. Now here's what we've got in Alaska. What we did, instead of cr trying to create a third party, we made a second government. How do you like that? Now here's the distinction, okay? First, let me tell you the three parts. There's the, there's the judicial, which we talked about. There's the militia, and there's the executive. The executive is the go-to guy. He's the gripe receiver. The judicial, you know, protects the, the rights of all and, 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 you know, helps defend people's rights. And the militia is, is you know, force, you know, to stop people that would dis destroy that. That's all the Israelites had. They had the Levites as their courts. They had Moses as their executive. And every man carried a sword. You know? And I, I would pitch this idea to you. That maybe, just maybe, anything beyond those three is just a tool of tyranny. That's all you really need to protect the rights of free people. You don't really need any more than that. And I'm afraid that anything beyond that might just be a means for a few to dominate the many, which is what we're all sick of. That's why we're here in this warehouse talking about how to stop that. Now let me give you a couple words of caution about this, creating this system, because other folks have done it before. It cannot be created in order to attack or antagonize the existing government. Let them crap in their own nest and bring themselves down under their own power. We're not, we're not here to do that to them. Right? But as it comes to the surface that they're a freaking joke, here's an alternative. It's putting a little bit of free market action into the, into the political uh, arena, the, the governmental arena. The other thing that it can't be is a clique of a few hardcore freedom lovers because that's kind of self-centered. It's got to be something that is a widespread rising tide culturally. You have to win the hearts and minds of your community. You have to win the, the respect of people. And that's what this common law court is doing. We're not taking any cases uh, with, with indictments against government. We're just building respect. We're just having it become you know, more and more accepted, more and more cherished by the people. Because they know that they can't get justice from a legal system. Legal system's not too concerned with justice. The idea that you don't have anything to worry about if you're innocent is laughable. That's a joke. Everybody knows that that's not true. So, I think you guys should do this here. I think that there's enough excitement in this room that you know that this is a good thing that you can do for yourself, put out an open invitation to everybody else who wants to participate in this form of self-governance. That's beautiful. You know, that's exactly how it's supposed to be. You know what my dad told me when I was young? He said, if you don't, um, what did he say? Um, he said, oh, control. He said, if you don't control yourself, somebody else will control you. Ooh, that's profound. That makes self-control a good thing because it eliminates other people's control. And so you know what we're doing in Fairbanks? We're, we're exercising self-control as a culture. 
We are cultivating, we are growing up a, a culture of self-control and self-sufficiency and self-reliance. And that's good. And you know what that'll do? That'll make us able to look at those storm clouds on the horizon and be okay with it. And you know what? I've had too many years of looking at those storm clouds and getting an ulcer. But I don't see those as an ulcer anymore. I see that as, as, as something that will bring a springtime for freedom. I see all these horrible things. How many of you get there? Oh my gosh, emails. You won't believe this. How many of you get those emails? I know more than that. You get those emails. I get them all the time. This next horrible thing is happening. When I read those, it's fine. You know, let them, let them pick their path. That's a totally different mindset. It set us free. Our culture is changing. And I want you guys to experience that too because it's beautiful. Now, there's a couple things that you've got to understand in your heart if that's to work. And then I'll, I'll, I'll finish up with these. You've got to put right and wrong above legal and illegal. Because when tyranny becomes law, rebellion becomes duty. And it is not rebellion at all. It is submission to the higher law that our government is in rebellion to. We're not the rebels. They're the rebels. And when you stand alone and you do what's right, you might get some flack from the folks that are doing wrong. But you know what? We have to have a cause greater than self-preservation. We, we have to. And if we don't put some skin in the game, and if we don't, reckon with those dark challenges like I talked about earlier we'll be a dark page on history but I don't think we're going to be a dark page on history I think we're going to be a bright page on history and and let me talk just just super brief about some baby boomer values pick on baby boomers present company excluded because if this was you you wouldn't be here but this is something that characterized the baby boomer culture it started in the 60s with the whole idea that everything is relative, that nothing can be known for sure, that you know we don't know any, anything is for sure, and then when, once you believe that lie, that nothing can be known for sure, the inescapable, inescapable conclusion is that everything is meaningless. If nothing is for sure, everything is meaningless. And once everything is meaningless and nothing has any real true value in and of itself, you're left with two absolutely horrible values and the inescapable conclusion that the only things that are worthwhile in this life are personal peace and affluency. And these two values have characterized the American culture since the, since the 60s. Affluency, meaning that the abundance of things. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm a capitalist, you know, and think that's, that's great. That's what we were commissioned to do. But when that is your primary and your only focus and success is measured purely by your accumulation of things, that, that is bad news. That's affluency. And then let me talk about the real linchpin. And I'm sure that all of you guys have, have uh, run up against this. And you need to recognize what you're running into when you run into this with other people. And that is personal peace. Personal peace means... I want to be left alone. I do not want to be disturbed for any reason by anyone, regardless of what that means for my children or my children's children. Here's when you will see that despicable value rear its head. When you try to talk to somebody about these ideas, when you try to talk to somebody about the way that our government is headed and they fiercely defend their ignorance. Have you had that happen? They fiercely defend their ignorance. What they are doing is they are protecting their personal peace. I do not want to be disturbed by anyone for any reason. It's time for those values to go away. And if everybody in this room makes a decision in their heart to drop those values and to have a cause greater than self-preservation and to have something that they can believe in and to leave something that their children can be proud of. You know, that might be scary, but you know what's even more scary is the thought of laying on my deathbed and handing my sword to my son, a sword that never saw blood, and saying, Son, you go do what I never was able to even look at. And it's way worse now, son. That is horrifying to me. You know what else is horrifying to me? 
to stand, the thought of standing before my Creator, my God, and looking Hashem in the eyes and saying, and saying, I bowed the knee to Caesar. I kissed the ring to get by. And I turned my back on right and wrong that you put into spin. And I, I bowed the knee. That is horrifying. That makes the 3 o'clock knock and ATF and IRS and all those guys a little less scary. It puts them in perspective. We need to have those be our values. And so I would leave you with this. A mission and a calling. To do these five things. Actually, I'm not even going to tell you the five things. Well, I will. But it's not the mission and the calling. If you like them, do them. If you don't, that's fine. I don't like boss, being bossed around. I won't boss you around. Sign the declaration, set up a Liberty Bell system, start a, mil a militia, get a common law court uh, going, and discover your leaders. Who's going to be the leaders? Who's going to be the leaders here? You've got to discover them. You know, there's a challenge to be met, and there's going to be folks. I think there's going to be folks in this room that rise up to be heroes and seize the day. You need to identify those people in, their mit in your midst. You need to support them. You need to look after them. And you need to cultivate that because that is what we need. That is what freedom needs. Now here's the mission that I'll lead you with, leave you with. We don't need to gun down the beast. Liberty always wins because tyranny self-destructs. What we need to do and here's the mission, and I want you guys all to strongly consider this being your mission, is that we need to guard the seeds of liberty. We need to guard the precious gems of freedom that are recognized in our, our founding documents. We need to take those seeds of liberty, and we need to protect those through this fiery shakeout of the natural consequences of the irresponsible actions of our run amok government. We need to shelter and guard those seeds of liberty and carry those through the flame and through the fire to the other side and plant those in the fertile soil when the, when the, when the smoke clears so that there can be hope for a brighter day after the devastating consequences of the horrible rebellion that our government has given to us. Let's be characterized by what we love and work towards that and let what we hate run its own natural course. That's my appeal, and I know that you will seize the day. Thank you.